Hello, everyone. Uh, let's uh, now talk about the ever famous t test. Uh, let's assume that our data follows a normal distribution. Then the distribution of the statistic t, which is going to be x bar minus mu naught divided by s over the square root of n, is going to be a t distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom when the null hypothesis is true. Based off of this, we can describe a test based off the t distribution. Um, uh, it's uh, pretty similar to uh, the test when we were uh, just using the z-test. All that we're really changing is the uh, distribution being used for computing p-values. So uh, this is still essentially a, chain, a, a test for uh, the location of the mean. Under the null hypothesis, we're going to say that uh, the mean is mu naught. And, and uh, our test statistic, so the test statistic will be t, which is x bar minus mu naught divided by s over the square root of n, which you may notice it as being a version of the z statistic I was talking about before where we replaced uh, sigma with s. And I said, well, you can use the normal distribution if your sample size is large. The t-test is um, appropriate for normally distributed data for all sample sizes, uh, not just for large sample sizes. So even though the test statistic is essentially the same, well, I mean, there's really no difference between the two. Uh, the results of the t-test are more reliable when your data is following a normal distribution for any sample size. Um, you can use the z-test if your sample size is large. Uh, and honestly, for the same reason, you can use the t-test uh, when your sample size is large too, regardless of whether your data is normally distributed or not, because the two tests will essentially start to look really similar to the point of being the same. Um, so I'm going to reference a t-distribution with new degrees of freedom. Uh, so I'm going to use uh, capital T underscore, uh, uh, capital T subscript new to refer to the uh, random variable that follows a t distribution with new degrees of freedom. And now we're going to consider what the alternative hypothesis is. Uh, suppose that the alternative hypothesis is that mu is less than mu naught, then the p-value is going to be the probability that our t random variable with new degrees of freedom is less than t. So more, oops, uh, if you, if you prefer, uh, you could refer to a curve. Uh, so visually, we have a T curve. Uh, we'll, we'll even just uh, mention that. This is a, t, uh, a curve for a T distribution with new degrees of freedom. Here is our test statistic T. We are computing a lower tail area. Okay. Uh, suppose that our, t our alternative hypothesis uh, says that uh, mu is greater than mu naught, then the p-value will be uh, the probability that uh, this uh, t random variable that I'm referring to is greater than our test statistic. So visually what this looks like is we have our t-curve, here's our test statistic, and we're getting the area underneath the curve to the right of the test statistic. The Let's suppose our alternative hypothesis is that mu is not equal to mu naught, then in that case, the p-value will equal two times the probability that uh, t nu is greater than the absolute value of t. So visually what that looks like is we have um, a curve and we are looking at the area uh, outside of the region enclosed by negative absolute value of t and t. So this area right here, okay? Which, what this means is that you're going to have to use uh, tables or R functions for referencing the T distribution. What kind of matters here, what the extra wrinkle here is that, um, uh, the, uh, is that we need to be sensitive to the degrees of freedom since that is a parameter 
of the t test so actually i should probably uh say that right now i never actually wrote it down but new is equal to n minus one so uh, that's what the degrees of freedom is it's n minus one which just for what it's worth if you continue learning statistics, the degrees of freedom will not always be n minus 1, right? But uh, when you're we're doing one simple test like this, then um, we then the degrees of freedom will, in fact, be n minus 1. Okay, so, um, uh, all right, so here is, uh, so uh, the if you're using Devore's book, uh, the recommended table for doing uh, tests involving uh, or, or for doing t-tests is table 8.8 .8, uh, but I'm just going to use r here uh, because it, it just seems silly in this context to not be using r. So repeat the test performed in example 3 but use the t-test instead. Do your conclusions change? So the t-statistic uh, is uh, recall from that uh, previous example example three which was in the previous video that x bar was equal to uh, 9.985 uh, mu naught was equal to 10 the alternative hypothesis said that mu was not equal to mu naught uh, and uh, uh, our significance level was uh, 0 0.05 and the standard deviation was uh, 0 0.094. And the sample size was 41. All right, so that's kind of the relevant information. Uh, so if this is a situation, uh, well, actually, hold on. Uh, mu, I, I should really replace mu naught with uh, 10. There we go. Mu is not equal to 10. All right, so the T statistic is going to be uh, 9.985 minus 10 divided by uh, 0 0.094 divided by the square root of 41, which is going to be negative um, uh, 1.02. So basically what we had last time, and we're just calling it T instead of Z. Okay, then uh, the P value uh, our degrees of freedom is going to be uh, 41 minus 1, which is 40. So our p-value is going to be 2 times the probability that a t random variable with 40 degrees of freedom is greater than uh, the absolute value of negative 1.02, which of course is 1.02. And we can go ahead and look that up using r. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, we'll start up R. The R functions for working with uh, the t-distribution are t-functions. So in this case, we would do 2 times 1 minus pt. Our input is 1.02. And the degrees of freedom is equal to 40. So we get a p-value of 0 0.313. Uh, so we'll just say uh, that this is uh, equal to uh, 0 0.313. And of course, there were alternatives that we could do. Like, for example, we could have said instead of this, uh, 2 times pt, 1.02, lower dot tail equals false. Uh, oh, right, df is needed, so df is equal to 40, or 41 minus 1 if you prefer, and we get the same thing. Okay, uh, so there we go. Uh, this is going to be greater than our significance level alpha, which is 0 0.05. So, uh, oops, uh, sorry about that. Um, scroll. Scroll, scroll. Uh, okay, so uh, alpha is equal to 0 0.05. Uh, so our conclusions don't change. So 
So in other words, the t-test uh, didn't really make uh, a difference here, uh, switching from the z-test to the t-test, but eh, still worthwhile. Uh, here is the r function t-test, and uh, we gave it the data set bearings. Uh, we said under the null hypothesis mu is 10. Uh, that is, is that exactly the same? Hmm, interesting. Uh, oh, okay, they got a different T statistic. I must have um, must have uh, made a mistake at some point when uh, computing the T statistic. So maybe it's numerically off, but you should be, uh, the, like the, the formulas should be right. In either case, this is pretty close, so we're, we're probably okay. All right, uh, type two error analysis in the case of t-testing, uh, it's it's going to be more complicated uh, than when sigma was known. Uh, so, it, it, well, yeah, it was, uh, so yeah, we since uh, we're doing t-testing, it, yeah, the, it's just more complicated. In fact, uh, I can't really give you any nice formulas uh, for type one and type two errors and such. Uh, so we would need to use either software or graphs like those provided in table 8.17. So this is giving us uh, curves for type 2 error analysis uh, for different degrees of freedom. Uh, so we have um, this this box right here. This graph is for when alpha is equal to 0.05, and this is a one-tailed test. So mu, either mu is greater than mu, mu naught or mu is less than mu naught under the, the alternative hypothesis. And then these graphs over here are for two-tailed tests. And you just kind of have to, if you were not using software and you were using these tables, you would just have to uh, do your best with the table, uh, with, with the graph, kind of making some numerical approximations. Uh, when using the software, the power of pi mu a is usually referred to rather than beta mu a. In the R lab videos, I am using, uh, I show how to use software for power analysis here I'm probably going to just uh, use uh, table 8.17. The input is usually not mu a, but d, which is equal to mu naught minus mu a divided by sigma. So in other words, you still have to guess sigma. And as before, you're going to uh, you're going to be um, uh, what was I going to say? Oh yeah, you you would probably want to overestimate what sigma is if you want to be conservative in your power and or in your um, uh, type 2 error and uh, sample size uh, computations uh, so all right uh, so uh, using table 8.17 answer the following for a one-tailed t-test was the probability that a type 2 error when the degree, degrees of freedom is nu equals 9 and d is equals 0 0.6 repeat with nu equals 29 so in other words, uh, what is the probability of a type two error in in these uh, in this situation? Uh, and this is for a one tail test. So we're going to use this table right here. We need to know what the uh, um, actually. There's an unfortunate issue, which is that I did not say what alpha should be. So we're just going to say that alpha is equal to zero point zero five. That's going to be our level of significance. All right. So we choose that level of significance. We look at our table, um, and uh, so new equals nine. So that's going to be this curve here, as you're following my mouse. And uh, d is equal to zero point six. That corresponds to what would be the x-axis, but this unfortunately is a rotated graph. So when d is zero point six, that's about here. So we go up to the to the line nine, and what I'm seeing is something between 0.2 and 0.3, so maybe 0.25 about. That appears to be about the type two error rate. So, um, uh, well, wait, hold on. Is that actually right? Uh, D equals zero point six. So 0 0.6 is about here, and I go to the line 9, so that's about, we'll say 0.25, okay. I think there might be an error in my notes. So uh, 
so we'll say about uh, 0.25 uh, when uh, new equals 9 and when new equals 29 this is going to be about what so 29 is right here uh, oh it pretty much just disappears so it's almost zero in this situation uh, yeah oh wait hold on hold on yeah this is one tail so about so this is almost zero when new equals 29 all right, uh, for a two-tailed test, when the sample size is needed so the test will, will have a type two error rate, what sample size is needed uh, so that a test with, will have a type two error rate of 0 0.1 when D is equal to 0 0.5, choose the smallest list of degrees of freedom because often we're probably going to have, like when we go to our graph, um, we are going to have some, we're not gonna be quite precise, so we should probably uh, choose a larger sample size. So uh, the two-tailed uh, part is going to be over here. And uh, so D is 0 0.5, so that's about here. And we want to have uh, a type two error rate of 0 0.1, which is right here. So what sample size would uh, attain that for us, we want to round up in essence. So if we're gonna round up, that's going to take us to the line where new is equal to 49. Uh, so we should, uh, oh, oh, actually we want not the, the not the smallest degrees of freedom. My apologies, that's, that's, that's not how we would think about it if we were actually trying to be conservative. Uh, largest. So if this is the case, then we're going to have new is equal to uh, 29, which means that our sample size should be 30. Okay, uh, moving on. Uh, something to consider when talking about p-values is that the p-value is a statistic like any other quantity we compute from data, and it has a sampling distribution. Under the null hypothesis, if the assumption of the, uh, the assumptions of the t-test, but not just the t-test, many of these tests uh, are met, then it can be shown that the p-value is actually following a uniform distribution with parameters 0 and 1, because the p-value is um, uh, the CDF, or related to the CDF, um, applied to the test statistic. So under the alternative hypothesis, though the p-value falls a distribution other than the uniform, uh, the so under the alternative hypothesis, the p-value will not follow a uniform 0, 1 distribu distribution. Instead, its sampling distribution is going to concentrate near zero as the sample size uh, grows or as, the or as delta grows. Uh, so here is actually a simulation to demonstrate this, con uh, this uh, idea. What I did is simulated a bunch of p-values. Uh, or, well, I wrote a function that's going to simulate p-values. Uh, by default, it does it a thousand times. Here's the mean under the null, uh, under the null hypothesis. Uh, here is the mean under the alternative. Uh, I've set this by default to null because the function is going to check if new a is null. And if it is, what that means is basically the user didn't set mu a. So it's going to say mu a is mu naught. Uh, by default, the sample size is 10, the standard deviation is one, and the alternative is either le two-sided less than or greater. So um, notice here I said that the alternative is a vector by default, and what we do to convert from a vector to a string is say, all right, whatever alternative is, take the first argument of that. Um, the only reason why I write it as a vector like this is as a way to communicate to the user what are valid options for alternative. So it's more for the user than the, the actual function. Then uh, uh, I replicate, uh, I do m times, uh, generating, a normally, gener generating a normally distributed data set where the true mean is mu a and sd is sd. Um, uh, do this for data sets of sample size n and then return 
the results of t-test where we have the alternative and the mean under the null hypothesis as parameters to the t-test and uh, the p-value of the t-test. So here is a histogram of simulated p-values and this is a situation where uh, the null hypothesis is true and uh, you can see from this histogram that a uh, a uniform distribution is not an unreasonable uh, description of what the uh, of, of the distribution of the p-value because that would be a, a distribution with with a straight line through one, uh, a line like this, and that doesn't appear to be un an unreasonable guess for the distribution of the p-value. Uh, here is the case where the true mean is 0 0.1. Uh, remember that under the null hypothesis, the mean is zero, but the standard deviation is one. So actually. Under these, situ under these conditions, it's actually rather difficult to detect the true mean under the null hypothesis. So you actually are still seeing something that's looking a lot like a uniform distribution. Uh, now that said, it's probably the case that this is not a uniform distribution, but something maybe more like this, but it's a very subtle, subtle difference from the uniform, extremely subtle. Uh, if we were to go to mu a equals 0 0.3, uh, all right, now it's started to have an easier time of detecting the um, of a detect uh, of it, it. The p values are now starting to concentrate around zero, essentially, and we could keep doing this, and the p and uh, the distribution of the p values is going to concentrate more and more near zero as we increase our mu a and the difference between uh, mu a and mu naught. So when we're computing a p-value and we get a statistically significant result, we may be interested in whether others repeating our study would also be able to get a statistically significant result under the same conditions. This is a measure of the fragility of our test. Uh, there is a paper uh, that talks about uh, the ideas here, and what they talk about is trying to report, uh, in addition to a p-value, a replication probability, which is the probability that a replication study, a future replication study, would uh, get uh, the same results as the study just published. And uh, what, what they know is that if the p-value is only barely less than your significance level alpha, there's a very good chance that uh, a replication study is going to get a p-value above alpha and not reject the null hypothesis. Um, even if the null hypothesis is false. So it could be the case that replication studies are going to struggle to actually replicate the results of this study. Um, on the other hand, if your p-value is much smaller than your significance level alpha, then it should be the case that the probability of, rep of replicating your study is high and that another study should get a very small p-value too. So um, this is just something to think about when thinking about issues surrounding replicability of studies. It might be a good idea, if possible, to report the probability of uh, your study being replicated, and that could um, indicate the fragility of the results. Um, all right, so uh, that's going to be it for this section and in the next section I'm going to talk, talk about tests concerning a population proportion. So I will see you there.